The following program is presented by the HTM Podcast Network. What's up, peeps, freaks, and geeks? Welcome back to this very special edition of the Hitting the Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast, brought to you in part by the Roar Network at thegorillaposition.com, Hami Media, and last word, on ProWrestling.com. My name is Jargo, I'll be your host for the day, and today I am joined alongside a very special guest. He's a world traveler with stops inside the WWE, TNA, Lucha Underground, and currently working with the NWA and Ring of Honor. He's a former Lucha Underground Trios champion, TNA King of the Mountain, and former three-time WWE Tag Team Champion. Ladies and gentlemen, the Dare Wolf, PJ Black. Mr. Black, welcome to the show. Hey man, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate you taking out the time. Uh, Mr. Black, the first question that we ask all of our guests, uh, tell us a little bit about when you discovered your love of professional wrestling and kind of who was on top at the time so our listeners can get a little bit of reference for your early influences inside of the business. Oh, so my, my dad was a wrestler and a promoter, so um, I kind of grew up in the business, so I kind of idolized him when I was a kid. Uh, when I was eight, like this, I made the conscious decision to be a pro wrestler when I when I get older. So, you know, like everyone from that age, from the eighties, early nineties, the colorful characters, those are the guys that I kind of look up to. Very cool. Very cool. I know that you grew up in South Africa and you actually still maintain a dual citizenship there since becoming a U.S. citizen in April of 2016. Uh, you did your early training with your father there, who was also the wrestler and promoter known as the Pink Panther. Tell us a little bit about the South African pro wrestling scene, both then and now. Okay, so in the uh, 80s and early 90s, uh, not many people know that South Africa was like an unofficial territory. And, um, you know, so I, I saw a lot of guys come up to our champion, and, you know, like Hogan and Andre and guys like that, but there was no internet or dirt sheets back then, so no one knew of this stuff. Um, so I, I got to see a lot of guys like that, and a lot of guys like Fitzsimmy and Rigo, they used to come stay there for like a year, two years at a time. Um, you know, and, and around 1999, it completely died out. A couple of new companies started up, and there's a couple of shows with, with, uh, with 15 shows and stuff like that. But uh, right now, I'm actually trying to build it up again. I started a company in South Africa recently, and we're going to do four big pay-per-views a year, and then take it from there, see how it goes. Awesome. That sounds great. What's the, what's the name of the company? It's called Slam Force Africa. Awesome. We'll have our, our people kind of start checking that out. Uh, many of us who have been following your career for years know about the South Africa connection, but what I hadn't realized until I was doing my research for the interview was you also spent five years of your early career in the UK training under Alex Shane and Mark Sloan at Frontier Wrestling Alliance. As well, you also received a degree in sports science in the UK. Were you training... And, and going to school and wrestling all at the same time? Was that all the same time frame? I was. It was all at the same time. I was going to school full-time and working like two or three jobs and wrestling on weekends. You know, like I didn't want any help from my parents to pay for any of that. So I kind of just did it all on my own. And like after five years of living in the UK, I, like, I kind of got kicked out, and, uh, <laughs> which was actually a good thing because uh, I did a couple of shows and then, then I got picked up by WWE shortly after that. That's awesome. Going along with the degree, you also work as a nutritionist, and I know you've been doing a lot of research in the field over the last year or so, combining the keto diet along with intermediate fasting. Tell us a bit about this other passion that you're working on, as well as you run a fitness blog. Yeah, I am um, so, so nutrition has always been my, my passion. That's what my degree is in. I have a master's degree, um, you know, and like this just I've been my whole life. I've been in, in the fitness industry, so I've been always researching different, you know, supplements and diets and you know, fat diets and all these things. And finally, I found something after all these years that kind of like completely worked for me. And if you if you look at how the body works and how influence and stuff like that works, it, it completely makes sense to eat that way. Um, not so much for athletes, but that's what I'm trying to bridge that gap of how athletes can get better performance with this sort of eating. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I, I I'm writing a book about that with some recipes and, you know, my findings over the years. And, um, yeah, it's very, very exciting stuff, but I don't want to say too much about it, but it's coming soon. 
I know, I know you're, you're doing a lot of work inside of keto. When did you discover keto and, and when did you make that change in your own personal lifestyle? So, I, I mean, I've been thinking about doing it for years and years and years. When I was younger, I kind of like felt like that sports my body needed what I needed to do. But I, I just never, you know, it was hard for me to make the change. And only about, about eight months ago, I, I made this, the change. And I was only going to do it for like 30 days or so to, uh, and then do the blood test and then run, see what it does to my hormones and my body and stuff like that. But I also like 40 days, it just, I just, I really liked it so much that I just like stayed on a ton of and tell us a little bit about this fasting, because I thought I read somewhere that you, you fast for 72 yeah. hours. Yeah, I do. I do 72 hours uh, once every once in a while. I'll do 24 hours once a month. And then the intermittent fasting, 16 hours, I'll do two or three times a week, uh, which, which used to be hard for me. But now that I'm on the road so much, I travel, to, it's actually a little bit easier. Being somebody who follows the keto diet, d- does it present issues when you're on the road? Oh, you know, sometimes it does, but, uh, you know, like, then I, you know, it's, it's better for me to, to actually skip a meal than it is to, to get one in. So <laughs> by, by mixing the intermittent fasting and the keto, I just, uh, it makes it a little bit easier actually on the road where if you think, uh, like straight up, it, it, uh, it sounds like it's harder, but it's, it's actually much easier. You know, like you still have to like be very knowledgeable of where you eat and like I actually to. Uh, luckily, with my schedule with ROH, I use bits, my dates and my hotel rooms like a couple of days in advance. So I usually have my groceries delivered to wherever I'm going. So that also makes life a lot easier. Very cool. Most of our listeners, I'm sure, are most familiar with your work in 2010, 2011 as part of the WWE, one of the last great storylines in the WWE, in my mind, the Nexus. You were only 29 years old at the time, but you were already a decade into the business. Tell us a little bit about that time period, what you were going through at the time, NXT, which was a game show at that point. And being inside of that moment, do you realize the gravity of that angle when you're living inside of it? Uh, no, none of us were at the time. We just thought it was something cool and something new. And, you know, the direction we were given by Vince was something fascinating. Um, going back a little bit, what you said about NXT, the game show, it was supposed to be like a, like a, like the Ultimate Fighter, you know, where a bunch of guys lived in the same house. And that was the, the original premises of it. But, you know, time got away from us, and, you know, that never happened. So on the day, they were like, oh, I guess we're just doing a wrestling show. And most of it was, everything was unscripted. Most people don't know that. Uh, I think we messed it up so bad that <laughs> onward was completely scripted. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it made for some entertain, entertaining television. A lot of us got embarrassed a lot of times. You know, but I feel like the wrestler, that happens a lot, and that's to grow as a performer. I find it crazy that so much of that was unscripted when WWE at this point in time is is so well known for everything is so meticulously scripted. I know, I know. It was a crazy time indeed, you know, like and and I, I wish they would just they would give us a little bit of direction, which they never did. They were just like, Yeah, go out and here, here's a match and oh you have a promo right now. <laughs> and a lot of it was live on T V too because we were shooting it on the on the East Coast and West Coast at different times and like you know, it was, it was a crazy time. It was a fun learning experience for sure. Have you ever sat down and watched any of that stuff back and just been like, holy crap? <laughs> I do, actually. I, I, I watch some of it back every once in a while, and people still send me GIFs or GIFs on, uh, you know, on social media about certain things that were funny to them. And, and uh, I, I show people like the obstacle course and stuff like that that we used to run. And because people go, oh, you should do Ninja Warrior or whatever the, those shows are. And I'm like, yeah, I used to do, I did a, I won an optional course once on NXT, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and especially the class that you were in there with. I mean, Wade Barrett was down there, Brian Danielson, yourself. It, it, that was, I mean, when you look at the great classes inside of NXT, if you just see that on paper without realizing it was a completely different format, that looks like even an amazing NXT class. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it back now, it's like it's like even like the whole NXT storyline and the roster at that time, and you know, it, just look how far we've come. Like I feel like everything in wrestling moves so quickly. 
Yeah, that's for sure. You would leave WWE in 2015 doing stints and TNA working the independent scene before signing up for the second season of Lucha Underground, aligning yourself with Johnny wherever he's working today, Mundo, Taya, Jack <laughs> Evans, the Worldwide Underground, which is one of my personal favorite factions that I've ever seen on a pro wrestling show. I just thought you guys had just incredible chemistry. Lucha Underground was a completely different experiment inside of the wrestling business. Tell us a little bit about how you found your way to the temple and the experience of a completely different format of TV show. Yeah, it was totally different, and I, I really enjoyed it. That was some of the most fun I've ever had in wrestling. Um, they actually did call me for season one, but like I was like, yeah, I've never heard of this company, and that, that was just when I quit WWE. So, you know, I didn't want to sign with anyone because like TNA called Auto H, and I didn't want to sign with anybody. So I was like, I just want to kind of do my own thing for a while. And I think DJ, the head writer, he called me. It was October, first week in October somewhere. And he's like, yeah, we're starting up this new thing called Lucha Underground. And I was like, I've never heard of this. Maybe, uh, maybe give me a call back in a year. And he did, like, exactly a year later, call me back. He's like, yo, we're about to film season two. Are you in? And by this time, obviously, I've seen season one air on TV. And I was like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever. How did I say no to this? But, like, it was impossible for me to predict that was going to happen. And, yeah, it was just it was a, an amazing time, so much fun. Uh, you know, like I, I, I look up to Johnny, he's one of my heroes and, you know, then I got to tag with him and Jack Evans too, is my favorite wrestler of all time. And then they put us in that faction and, and they let us do whatever we wanted, which I feel like in wrestling, that doesn't happen a lot these days, but when it does, when things happen organically, that's why, that's what made the attitude era so good. You know, when things happen organically, people can relate to that and, and yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, the chemistry amongst that faction was just incredible. Some of the, the best lines and some of the best humor throughout that show all came from the <laughs> worldwide underground. These days you're calling no, so much. these days you're calling Ring of Honor home as well as doing some work with the NWA, even challenging the reigning world heavyweight champion Nick Aldis for the ten pounds of gold recently. I know you had several options before signing with ROH. Tell us why you felt ROH was the right place for you in 2019. Um, it just the, the, the creative freedom again that they, they give me, and also the schedule. And one of the things that I've always wanted to do was uh, was New Japan, and so with their partnership with New Japan, I knew that was a step closer. So you know, everything just fell into place, and uh, the money was good, the offer was good, and and, and the biggest thing for me, creative free freedom and that that was a no brainer for me kind of you mentioned New Japan. I, I, I was a little surprised as I was going through your career that you hadn't done any big stints inside of Japan. No, not yet, but it's uh, it's coming soon. Who promises promises? I'm a big New Japan fan. Don't <laughs> tease me, PJ. Don't tease me. <laughs> You debuted for ROH at Survival of the Fittest in 2018 and then signed an exclusive contract with ROH back in January that officially went into effect in March. During that time, we've seen you undergo quite a personality change inside of ROH, really starting with the matchup with Bandito at Honor Reign Supreme. As one of the veterans now inside of a very young locker room at ROH, did you feel an obligation to pass on your knowledge of the business and perhaps that led a bit to the change? And is there anyone inside of the locker room right now that you're looking forward to watching develop over the next five to 10 years in the business? Oh, wow. What a late question. What a great question. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, that was also one of the reasons I set up ROH because I, I kind of looked at the roster and everyone that they signed and I was like, yes, these are the guys I want to work. These are the guys that I can have great matches with. A lot of, a lot of older guys and a lot of, like you said, of young up and comers like Ben Vito. I mean, when he signed, I know everyone was trying to sign him. Like literally every company on the planet was trying to sign him. And the, re and he, the, the fact that he signed there meant something to me. I was like, okay, cool. This company is doing something right. You know, they're trying to grow, they're trying to build on um, stuff. Because obviously I had a lot of top stars leave to other companies. So, uh, you know, yeah, guys, again, like guys like Rush and Bandito, guys like that. I was like, yep, these are guys, these guys are the future of the business for sure. Especially for our race. So, it made, it, uh, made my decision very easy, and you know I get to work with these guys every week, which is fantastic. I've had some of my most memorable matches in the last month alone with these guys. Bandito just killing it in the best of Super Juniors over in Japan currently. When when you look at the landscape inside of ROH right now, what what is your goals? What do you have your sights set on for 2019? 
I just I just want to keep going on the track that I am, like, you know, having just trying to have the best matches possible and trying to show people what I can do because I feel like I was out for a year or two too, so people kind of don't know what uh, what PJ Black is all about. So I just want to, like, you know, just do me and, and let people get to see that. So let, let's talk a little bit about Lifeblood. We, we, we've kind of seen a little bit of a development inside of Lifeblood here with yourself where we can't necessarily tell if, if you're courting Lifeblood, if Lifeblood's courting you, who's trusting who at this point. Where do you stand with the group Lifeblood inside of ROH currently? Well, I, I kind of like all those guys. I respect all of them, and I, I really like what they're doing. You know, and They're all fantastic athletes, and um, you know, I, I feel like I can contribute to this group. And I was trying to join them, but at first they were a little bit hesitant. But now they have such the uh, Finley's injured, and a few of the other guys like the Bandidos, also super juniors, and he's always on tour and stuff like that. So their numbers are a little bit down. So you know, like only time will tell. But I'm trying to convince them to give me a shot. And then uh, you know, when, once that happens, like I kind of like where they're going and, and what they stand for. And I feel like that's that's what I need to stand for right now too in ROH. And I feel like factions in ROH can can only be a good thing. Oh, that's absolutely for certain, especially when we see, uh, you know, friends of the show like Shane Taylor aligning with, you know, Bully Ray, and we, we got to have some kind of opposition to that. Right, exactly. And uh, I, I think this is going to be a very big year for, for ROH and a very exciting year, too. And, and, and for wrestling as a whole, with all the stuff popping up and new companies starting and all that, I think it's a, a fantastic time to be a, a fan and an even better time to be a wrestler right now. We've got some huge things on the horizons for ROH, starting June 1st in Kent, Washington, the 2nd in Portland, Oregon. Then you all head back to the East Coast June 28th for Best in the World and June 29th in Philadelphia. Visit ROHWrestling.com for ticket information as well as how to become an Honor Club member to catch the shows live. Mr. Black, we want to thank you very much for joining us today. Tell the people how to keep up with you on social media and anything else that you'd like to plug before we let you go today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, if you go to my website, pjblack.com, all my links to social media will be on there. I'm very active on social media, especially Instagram and stuff like that. I have a little YouTube channel, which I document some of my travels, have some of my favorite matches on there. And yeah, basically everything you need to know is on pjblack.com. Thank you so much, PJ. Hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for your time, bro.